Hey guys, this is Control Destroy. My name is Nathan, aka The One, and today we're going to continue our introduction into Amba Java by learning how to set up an autonomous op mode that incorporates basic sensors to get accurate automatic movement. If you missed our last two videos covering basic Java programming and setting up your robot's first two programs, be sure to check those out. Without further ado, let's get into autonomous. We're going to start by making a new file. We'll call it auto. Make sure you don't call it just autonomous because that simple file name will conflict with methods and it will be rejected. So we're going to go off the sample basic op mode linear and this is an autonomous. Okay. Now we're going to start pretty much from scratch. So let's get rid of this copyright. We'll get rid of this comment. Uh, we'll get rid of everything between the initiation of the class and the run op mode method. Uh, we'll delete everything between the run op mode method and wait for start, and everything between wait for start and the end, including this last bracket. So now we have the bare bones of the program we need. We have our import statements, our naming convention, the creation of our class, and the run op mode method with a wait for start statement. So uh, let's begin by fixing the name convention to what we want to call it on the phone, which is auto, so it matches up with what our class is called. We'll stick in the test group like we did our earlier op modes. You'll see that this class is extending linear op mode instead of op mode like our teleops did because it isn't autonomous. And we also don't have nearly as many methods as our teleop because it runs by once you hit init, it runs from top to bottom, and once you hit play or start, then it runs that from top to bottom. No complex methods in between. So let's begin with what we did in our teleops, which is call upon the configuration of a robot. We'll do that by doing robot hardware, call it robot, and it'll be a new robot hardware. It's being created, so it's a method. And then when we initialize or the run out mode begins, we'll say robot.init, and we'll call upon the hardware map we created in that class. So now we can use everything on our robot. So let's get into a basic autonomous. And this will be after the wait for start method, so it'll be after you hit play on your phone. We'll say robot.motor1.setpower to 1. Do the same to our motor2. We'll give it inverse power, so it'll run forward, because that motor will be inverted, likely. And we'll call a sleep statement. So what a sleep statement does is it lets the program not do anything for the lot amount of time. And the time you input is in milliseconds. So this statement will make the program do nothing for one second. That means the robot's going to set both of its motors to one, wait one second, and then we want to do something else. We want to set the motors back to zero. Because if we don't, then the robot will just set power to one, wait for a second, and then just keep running because it doesn't say anything else. So we're going to set the power back to zero after one second. So now we have a basic autonomous. Your robot's going to run forward for one second. Your robot's going to set full power to both motors, wait one second or a thousand milliseconds, and then set power to zero. You're already up and running. But the thing is, this is a bad way to run autonomous. Since your battery will likely fluctuate between matches, say from 11 volts to 12 volts to 13 volts, even 14 volts, your robot's going to run different amounts based on that power. If it's higher, it'll run farther, and if it's lower, it'll run shorter. This is why you want to use encoder values during autonomous, because encoder values, even if you have a low battery or high battery, it'll always run to the same position, or almost, as long as you don't conflict with anything in the playfield. So let's do that. Let's get rid of these statements here. And... Before we set their power, let's set their target position. So I'll say robot.motor1.setTargetPosition. We'll set it to say 1000 encoder ticks. We'll do the same for our motor2. But we'll set it to negative 1000 encoder ticks. And we'll set regular power. So now our robot's going to run forward until both of its wheels are at either 1,000 encoder ticks or negative 1,000, and it'll be running at full power for both of them. We're not going to use a negative here because we already used negative in the encoder value. Now your robot's going to run nearly to the same exact spot every single time. This is just what you want. 
The thing is, before we want to run anything else, we want to make sure we call a sleep method that gives enough time for this to complete. So say it takes two seconds, we'll say 2000 milliseconds, and now we're good to run something else. Because the motor's target position will be set, their power will be set, the robot will start moving, and once it gets to its position, once the sleep statement is ended, then it'll begin the next step. Uh, for our next step, we'll make a turn, but we need to make an accurate turn. If we were to do something like this without inversion in the second motor, the robot would turn, but very inaccurately, for the same reason where we didn't use power for driving forward. The same thing with encoder values. If you were to set the same encoder values so it turned, it still wouldn't be very accurate. So we're going to use something else. We're actually going to use the gyro sensor that we set up in our robot hardware. And we're going to use it by saying, while the robot's gyro sensor which we call gyro sensor in our configuration. If it's heading, which we're going to retrieve by get heading, is less than 90, then set the power of the motors to the proper values at which they turn. And then once that statement negates, we will set the power back to zero. So what does this do? So a while statement will run continuously in loop until its parameter goes false. So that means while your robot is on the 360 degree scale with the gyro sensor, while that gyro sensor is outputting that you're, you haven't moved 90 degrees yet, then your robot's going to keep turning. But once it has reached 90 degrees and gone over it, it is going to escape this while statement and then set the power to zero. This is perfect. There are a few troubles with this though. This is because a gyro sensor goes from 0 to 360, and when you calibrate it in your configuration, it sets it to 0. So that means if you turn your robot one way, it'll go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. But if you go the other way, it'll go 0, 360, 359, 358, and so on, because it's on a 0 to 360 loop. This means if you want to make your robot run the other way, say when you have negative values for both these motors, you might have to do something like 360 minus 90 and you'd have to do a greater than symbol. That's because you want to stop your robot at actually 270 degrees and run it while it's above that. Because while you're above 270, say 360, 350, 340, your robot is going to be turning into that range. This might be hard to think about, but something that's helpful is outputting telemetry and your driver controlled, actually outputting this get heading, and turning your robot manually to see what range it's going to be going into and where you want to stop. So we'll set this back to less than 90, just for simplification, and let's talk about another error in gyro sensor. So if your robot moves this 1000 encoder ticks and it runs forward, there's a chance that your gyro sensor might get off. Say it might bump a few degrees in either direction. It could bump up into 1, 2, 3, or it might bump the other way into 360, 359, 358, and so on. That means if your robot bumped a little bit in the other direction to 360, this while statement is never going to turn the robot, because 360 is not less than 90, and it's automatically just going to go to this set power 0, and your robot won't do anything. A good way to prevent this is to take this a similar statement like this, and we'll stick an OR between it, and we'll say if get heading is greater than 355. This means that either this turn is going to run while it's greater than 355 or while it's less than 90. This means that even if your robot bumps in the opposite direction to 359, 358, it'll still be safe. It'll still begin the turn, hit 0, and count up 1, 2, 3, 4 until 90. And once it hits 90, it will no longer be less than 90, also won't be greater than 355, and the program will run just like you want. Just for another demonstration, we'll do the same method as if you're running in the opposite direction. So we'll set these back to negative. We'll say, well, greater than 360 uh, minus 90. And we would do something like less than 5. So even if your robot bumps up into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, your robot will still begin its turn, spin around to the 360s, and go until 270. This definitely takes a lot of testing and a little bit of work to get your head around, but it's very useful and very accurate to get the exact angle you want to turn your robot to. Now, one thing you're going to have to implement in your program is that you can't keep switching between target position and regular power, because your robot needs to be in that mode. So in our configuration, we defaulted to run without encoder. 
But here we begin by running by the encoder or running to position. So that means before we do this, we're going to actually have to say robot that motor one set mode, get the modes from DC motor, uh, we'll get the run mode and we want to use run to position. We'll do the same for motor two. And we're good on that front. The thing is, once we're done running to position for our initial run forward and we get our turn, we run by simple power. That means before we turn, we're going to want to say run without encoder. And same with this one, run without encoder. And we're good to go. So your robot will wait for start. Once it starts, it'll set its mode to run to position, run for a thousand encoder ticks forward. There will be a two second delay so it can complete its run. From then, it will set its motors to run without encoder. It will turn until 270 when these statements are both false. And the robot will set its motor back to zero. You won't need a sleep statement here because this statement just keeps running until this one completes. So you don't need a delay anywhere. Servos run exactly the same. If you wanted to put your servo arm up, you'd say something like robot.servo arm dot set position to one and you'd want to give that a delay so you have time to run it say just 500 milliseconds and your arm will go down uh, now before we move on let's save this okay we have an error on line 23 variable hardware map uh, this is because the H is not supposed to be capitalized we should be able to save it now all right now let's move on to using a color sensor. A color sensor is used a lot of the time in FTC to detect either red or blue because those are alliance colors or detect say a white line. Uh, let's do both of those. First let's go into our robot hardware and create our color sensor. So uh, before we instantiate it and define it, we actually have to import the code for it. And this will be import com dot qualcom dot robot core dot hardware dot color sensor as a naming convention to import that and now we should be good so we'll uh, instantiate it up here we we'll want to make a public color sensor variable and we'll call it color sensor and then we'll define it as uh, the hardware map dot get color sensor class and our configuration we'll call it color sensor so it'll be easy to retrieve and we're good if we don't have to do anything like calibrating because the color sensor does need that you can do things like turn the light on and off and I'll provide a link in the description with color sensor code so you can do that but we won't get into that so let's go back to our auto um, so the four main things with a color sensor you're going to use is robot that color sensor, so we're going to get our color sensor. You'll be using the dot red method. Let me just paste this. You'll either be using the, the dot red method, the dot blue method, the dot green method, and the dot alpha method. There is another one called ARGB, but we also won't be covering that. There will be a link in the description covering everything about a color sensor, and you can read through it yourself. Uh, for now, we'll cover what is mainly used. So a color sensor detects how much red light, blue light, and green light it's taking in. Green light is nearly never used in FTC because the alliance colors always correspond to red and blue. So that means you're going to be wanting to see how much red values, blue values, your, co your color sensor is taking in. The alpha value is just how much light you're taking in. So if you're looking at white, a lot of light is coming in, while if you're looking at black, a lot of black is coming in. So... Let's use these statements to do something. We'll say if we uh, detect red, we want this servo arm to go to position one. So we'll say if uh, red, the red that we're detecting is greater than the blue we're detecting, then run the servo to position of one. So that means if you're looking at a red ball, the color sensor is going to be reading a lot more red value than blue value. So this will run. And if you're looking at a blue ball, 
the blue value is going to be much higher than the red value, so this will not run. The thing is, these values will depend a lot on how far you are from the object you're reading, what color sensor you're using, and how you have everything set up. That means you're probably going to want to output telemetry in your driver controlled and manually put stuff up to the color sensor and see what it's reading to make sure you're using the right values. For example, a rev color sensor is based on a red sensor. That means it naturally picks up more red light than blue light. So if you're in that case, you might want to do something like blue plus 10 to offset the red balance and make it more even. But this takes a lot of testing on your end, so make sure you're seeing exactly what values you want to be reading and what you want to do when those values are read. Now we'll do something like if alpha is greater than 0.5. This also takes testing, but say you went up to your white line, and when, when you read white, it's 1, and when you read black, it's 0. You'd want to do something like, if the alpha you're taking in is greater than 0.5, then do what you want. There's a way to just read if you're looking at light, or looking at something bright, like white, and stuff like that. So now we've learned how to run by target position, how to turn with a gyro sensor, and switch your modes properly. Uh, how to function a servo, and how to use a color sensor. So these are the basics of what you're going to be using in nearly any autonomous program for an FTC game. And you're going to have to just orient everything yourself to do exactly what you like. If you didn't understand anything in the video or wanted me to cover anything else, please leave a comment and I'll get back to you as fast as I can. Be sure to subscribe if you want to see any of our future content on basic programming as well as advanced programming for developing more complex code or even for mechanical engineering and the engineering notebook. Also, check out our website, team9862.com, because that's where we'll be posting uh, step-by-step guides covering things like programming and making certain mechanical mechanisms. But that'll do it for this video. This has been Control Destroy. My name's Nathan, aka The One, and I'll see you in the next one. I hope you learned something. Peace.